San Antonio and our 2013 annual conference. And welcome to our 25th National Speech Contest Finals. I'm Karen Gambala, your 2013 National Vice Chairman. I'm honored to be your MC team. And I'd like to thank you for attendance at this great event. I trust you all enjoyed our opening luncheon yesterday. And also our McFeely Award recipient's uh, keynote speech, Mr. Marcus Buckingham, last night. I believe we're off to a terrific start. At this time, we're going to conduct what many consider to be a highlight, if not a key highlight, of this conference weekend. Before we start the contest, I want to express my sincere thanks to John Bonnack, CM, this year's National Contest Director. John, thank you very much, sir. John serves on our enemy board of directors and is retired from Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. The contest director is responsible for planning the contest, briefing the contestants and judges, and securing personal help, personnel help to run the contest. Let's show our appreciation once again to John. <laughs> Today, we have the distinct privilege of listening to four exciting young adults. They will each present a speech about leadership and what it means to them. Each speaker will lift your spirits and quite frankly, take your power. Just a few words about the contest and some of its rules. Most of you are already, but it never hurts for people, right? You are not, I repeat, not to applaud after each speaker. The lack of applause and a few minutes of silence allow the judges to concentrate while scoring the contestants. The speakers have been advised of this procedure and will be expecting that period of silence after their speeches. At the conclusion of the contest, and after we have dismissed the judges to complete their scoring, all the speakers will return to the room and be introduced. A reminder, no flash photography is permitted during the contest itself. There will be lots of opportunities for pictures later in our program. In addition, may I ask everyone Please pull out your cell phones. Push the off button, which I'm sure we really do. I'm sure they're all off, right? But it's time to script a real quick I'll tell you this, uh, the joke about this rule. The North Texas Council, which is what I'm part of, from uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Peter Burns who runs the speech contest, and his classic line every time he asks us to turn our cell phones off is, if, you have, if your cell phone rings during one of the speeches, you have to have it ring at the same moment for every other speech. <laughs> so he makes it a point to tell us that we have to turn it off. At this time, let me also give you some basic information about the rules of this contest. Presentations by our contestants will be in alphabetical order, A, B, C, and D. It's the numerical order, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. All the speakers were assigned a letter during an earlier random call. Speeches are not to exceed six minutes, nor be less than four minutes. Otherwise, penalty points are deducted. Judging is done by a select group of people, including some Toastmasters from the local area. Our judges are highly skilled and experienced in the art of public speaking. Each judge will submit an individual score for each contestant. The chief judge will tally the scores for each contestant, and the decision of the judges will be final. We'll have the pleasure of introducing them to you a bit later. As our most popular civic activity and program, the enemy speech contest was developed with four primary objectives. First objective is to engage high school students in the study of leadership and its many attributes and components. The second purpose is to involve them in researching, writing, and delivering the speech in what they've learned or observed. Third objective is to provide our students with an incentive to develop communication skills that are essential to their success of the mind. The fourth purpose is to provide winning students with financial rewards that will help them further their formal education. 
So now we will start our count. Ladies and gentlemen, here is contestant A. No one knows what the next change is going to be. What unexpected opportunities lie just around the corner. These wise words from poet Kathleen Norris bring to light something that we must all keep in mind. The simple reality that change is inevitable. It defines the world, and in the process it defines who and what we are as human beings, as the result of how we handle the changes that we face every day. But there are also those who go out and create now that is Leo. This morning, ladies and gentlemen of the National Management Association, let's discuss the factors that embody what makes a leader, about the qualities and contributions that cast them amongst the greatest to ever exist. Today, let us look at different examples and aim to discover the unexpected leader. To begin, let me take you back to the 1960s and paint you a picture of growth in Massachusetts along the National River. For decades, industries and towns had used it as a dump. Dead fish bobbed along its waves, and at times the water was red, green, or blue for pigments discharged by industries. This was a challenge that faced longtime resident Marion Stoddard, who believed that injustice must never be tolerated. Instead of doing nothing, she committed herself, not by complaining or filing lawsuits, but by creating a plan and sticking to it even when officials laughed. Acknowledging fear and still choosing to act, Stoddard began to use one of the most honorable skills of politics, one on one persuasion. She educated power brokers, and winning them over, they stopped polluting and agreed to start cleaning up the river. She got the state to bend open dumping, and when federal matching for funds promising to build a treatment plant failed to materialize, she gathered 13,000 signatures on a petition sent to President Richard Nixon. The funds arrived immediately. Five decades later, the National River is still clean. And a citizens group founded by Stoddard keeps eye on the water, which is now able to support wildlife and recreation as a result of her sense of justice and her willingness to take risks. Now, another individual who was willing to take risks was Charles Morgan Jr., an American civil rights attorney, another David against the Goliath of this time, inequality. In the same decade as Mrs. Stoddard, Charles Morgan faced the issue of dairy management, where elected representatives were manipulating state voting boundaries in order to disenfranchise African Americans. Now behind every movement, every cause, and every vision is a group of people who need help. Charles Morgan saw American citizens deprived of one of their most basic rights as people who deserved a voice. So in the 1964 Supreme Court case, Reynolds versus Sims, Morgan successfully argued that district state legislators need to be of nearly equal size, establishing the principle of one man, one vote. Morgan didn't see this as an opportunity to define his title, nor did he use it to elevate any sort of status. Instead, he recognized how much he depended on his people and how much they depended on him Seek out the vision of the American people in order to ensure equality and prosperity. Now, for myself, I'm given the opportunity to thrive and prosper only as the result of the care and dedication of my doctors at UCSD. At the age of only eight years old, I was diagnosed with a rare genetic condition, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. As a true one in a million, my body has no receptors to filter cholesterol. And from that early age, I was at risk for a heart attack. Now, my doctors fought to acquire a machine for a medical treatment that now enables me to live a healthier life, which only goes to demonstrate the problem that it takes a village to raise a child. And with the support of the medical community, and my loving family, I've had the gift of an environment that has forever changed what I aim for in life. I am grateful that my condition has never impeded 
He said, I've used it as a platform, inspiring my cause to promote awareness of genetic conditions. As an ambassador of awareness, I lead not only by volunteering to conduct research on my own condition, but by going out into the community and inspiring hope. Because of all the challenges that you face along the way, hope can make all the difference. As leaders, as individuals determined to make that difference, we must learn from the lessons of Mary and Sartre and Charles Morgan Jr. in order to realize that leadership doesn't require titles or status. On the contrary, at the root of our own endeavors, leadership begins by caring for a group of people and seeking out that cause along with them as you rely on them as much as they do on you. With a sense of justice and a willingness to take risks, true leaders act in the face of fear that paralyzes all too many. But in doing that, we build character. We build a better future, whether you be one in 10 or one in a million. If we all begin there, no matter your age, gender, Creed. I truly believe that the challenges that we face in our lives will come to expect the unexpected, believe in the unbelievable, and achieve the unachievable. Thank you. Today's speech contest, originally the American Enterprise Speech Contest, began as a grassroots program in the southeastern area of the United States. The first national contest was held in 1988, which, as I said at the outset, makes this morning's event, our 25th, the annual contest finals. In the early 1990s, the NMA Educational Foundation conducted corporate, chapter, and individual fundraising to help support the cost of the contest at regional and national levels. Most NMA chapters and councils have their own fundraising activities to help pay for prize monies and other contest expenses. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our second contestant, contestant B. go about leading, or a situation where the leader did a poor job in clearly explaining what the goal was. Now, on a more personal level, I'm sure if I ask to see a show of hands of those who have been that leader struggling to get their desired results, the majority of the hands would go up. And hey, mine's would too. Well, to those of you who would have raised your hands, I'm sure you'll find this message truly beneficial. And to those of you who would not have raised your hands, I'm sure you'll still be able to pick up a few tips as to how to enhance your leadership skills. Just last summer, I witnessed two of my friends go through the same leadership dilemmas as those who would have raised their hands. They were the captains of their swim team and therefore responsible for organizing and leading their team's annual car wash fundraising. Now, at the car wash, they had a few mishaps. Instead of finding new ways to improve, they replicated everything that they did in the previous year's car wash. They had a lot of supplies missing, and they had a few teammates missing. In the end, they brought in a very low amount of money. Now, had they used the process I developed called the five E's to effective leadership, they would have been able to effectively lead their team towards and to complete their goal. I'm sure you're wondering, well, what are the five E's to effective leadership? Glad you asked. The five E's to effective leadership is a simple five-step process that every leader should have. And it's very easy to remember because, as you may have guessed, every key word begins with the letter E. Explore, explain, engage, excite, and execute. Now let's go back through these five E's and see exactly what they mean and how they can help you. The first E to the five E's of effective leadership is to explore different ideas. The leaders should look at all of their options. The team captains should have looked at different venues that they could have the car wash, different clothing they may have wanted their teammates to wear, 
They could have even asked their teammates for suggestions as to how to improve that year's car wash. Exploring different ideas ensures that the leader picks the most beneficial and efficient plan. The second E is to explain the goal. This is a crucial step of the process. The leader should now clearly explain what needs to be done. The team captain should have told their teammates that they were going to have upperclassmen wash the cars, while the underclassmen will be responsible for rinsing them off. And that in the end, they wanted to have a team bonding experience by way of washing X amount of cars in order to raise X amount of money. Explain the goal ensures that there are no misunderstandings amongst anyone involved. The third E is to engage the team. The leader should now think of ways that they can get people involved. A great way to do this is by assigning roles. The team captains could decide two girls to maybe pre advertise another two to collecting the money, and maybe another two to away the cars in. When people feel engaged in doing something, they will be more committed to the success of the goal. The fourth E is to excite others about the goal. Now this first starts with the leader. If the leader isn't excited, he or she should not expect the group to be. When people want to excite someone, a great way to do this is by reminding and emphasizing the reward that's to come once the goal is met. The team captain should have been reminding their teammates that they were raising money for maybe new team suits or maybe for a new team bonding trip to here in San Antonio, Texas. When people are excited about doing something, they will put forth more effort and even start contributing their own ideas. The fifth and final E to the five E's of effective leadership is to execute the plan. This means showtime. Everything that you explained as a goal in step two now comes into action. And because everyone is on the same page and everyone is excited about completing the goal, everything should turn out great. Unfortunately for the team captains, everything did not turn out so great. They had a lot of items that were missing, people not enthusiastic about doing the car wash, and just all around chaos because the goal wasn't clearly explained. So, in order for you to avoid downfalls like these, use the five E's to effective leadership whenever you come into a leadership position. Or share them with someone else who may be having a hard time leading a group. Explore, explain, engage, excite, and execute. Thank you. The NMA Speech Contest is open to students from 9th to 12th grades. It is based on four levels of competition. First is the chapter level, where students compete against other local contestants for prizes supplied by our NMA chapters. The second level is the council competition. This involves the first place winners from the various chapters in a particular geographical area that comprise an NMA council. If there is no council in the vicinity, the next level can be combined, a combined chapter contest. That winner then represents the council or combined chapters at the third level, which is held at the East and West Enemy Leadership Development Conferences in April or May of each year. We are at the fourth and final level of competition today. The first place prize winner is awarded $4,000 cash. The second place prize is $1,000 cash. The two third place Winners will receive a check for $500 each. At this time, may I present contestant C. every teenage girl, I can tell you what my response would be to a statement like that. I'd first take a moment to <clears throat> compose myself, and then proceed to say something along the lines of, honey, first off, if you have to think about it, you don't. And second, I don't honestly believe that you even know the first thing about what love really is. Now, there are those of you in the audience going, what is this girl doing? Talking about love in a leadership speech, and how does it even apply to the topic? Well, today I'd like to do just that. 
Today we would like to take a closer look at this unique virtue called love and show you how it really does play a powerful role in the area of leadership. In order to do this, we first need to have a proper definition. Basketball coach John Wooden, in his book Wooden on Leadership, answers the question, what is love? By quoting 2 Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind, over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. He goes on to say that a leader filled with this type of love is a powerful force, but a leader who tries to lead without it will turn around one day and find there is no one following. Love is essential. Author Gerald Mulvey in his book The Leadership Ladder says leadership demands love. In fact, where there is no love, there is manipulation, corruption, and exploitation. Mulvey outlines seven important key truths about the virtue of love in leadership. I'd like to discuss only three of them with you today. First, love appreciates. This is one of the greatest needs we have as human beings, the need to feel wanted and appreciated. In fact, this desire is so deep within each one of us that we will go to extremes to fulfill it. An effective leader acknowledges this truth by listening and giving credit and honest appreciation for work well done. Second, love believes. A leader with love believes in the potential of his people and displays confidence in them. Not only does he encourage them, but he also gives them chances to grow. And when an individual stumbles, the leader looks upon the mistake as a teaching moment, but does not dwell there. Instead, he turns his focus towards the potential of the individual and works to unleash that potential. University of California's head football coach, Nibs Price, displayed all of these characteristics well when in 1929 his team, the Golden Bears, were playing in the Rose Bowl. All was going well when in the middle of the second quarter, Price's center, Roy Regals, picked up a fumble, somehow got turned around and ran 69 yards in the wrong direction. Everyone was shocked. Can you imagine the humiliation that Regals must have felt when he realized his mistake? Fully expecting his coach to tear him apart, Regals told him, Coach, I can't do it. I couldn't face that crowd to save my life. Price merely placed a reassuring hand on Regals' shoulder and said, The game's only half over, Roy. Now get up, get back out there, and give it all you've got. And that's exactly what Regal did. And third, love gives. True leadership is not about receiving. It is about giving. But in order to give, one must first choose to do so. One of the best examples of this type of giving love is that of Johnny, a seven-year-old boy whose brother was diagnosed with a rare disease that required a blood transfusion. Johnny's blood type matched perfectly to that of his brother's and his parents were wondering if he would be willing to donate some blood. Johnny, who was normally a very happy-go-lucky sort of boy, became very sad and broke down into tears. His mother could do nothing to console him, and this went on for days. Finally, Johnny did agree to the procedure. The appointment was scheduled, and everything seemed to go just fine. Afterwards, Johnny's mother approached him and said, now, honey, it wasn't that bad, was it? Johnny, with tears filling his eyes, turned towards his mother and said, Mommy, how soon will I have to die? There is no greater love than this. As John Wooden once said, love may not conquer all, but it conquers much. So ladies and gentlemen, do not settle for being the type of person who says to their followers, I love you, I think. Instead, be the type of leader who through your words and your actions conquers much. Be the one who says, I believe in you. You can do this. Now get up, get back out there, and give it all you've got. Because the game 
is only half over. One of the most desirable qualities from the individual to possess in today's competitive environment is the ability to speak and say Today, it's more than what we used to simply call public speaking. Whether it's a classroom type situation, a business meeting, community service gathering, or just a general group discussion, in order to be understood, one must be able to communicate effectively. It's a classic example of learning by doing. It is our hope that this contest not only results in our students becoming proficient in that skill, but we trust that preparing for this speech has them thinking more deeply about what it means to be an effective leader. Our country, our business world, our global economy all call for a new generation of people who can provide clarity and direction and leadership. Our anime speech contest is a program that's definitely in the right place and at the right time. Your support by being here today lends a critical air of importance to what we are trying to accomplish. At this time, ma'am present contestant B. core assumptions about your life. So let's take your 9 to 5 grind, your Monday morning Starbucks runs, your conference calls, your synergy meetings, your management workshops. Let's take it all, burn it, get rid of it, throw it away. It doesn't define you or your future because now you're Batman. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Batman mythology, let me enlighten you to the world of the Dark Knight. So Bruce Wayne was the son of ridiculously wealthy doctor Thomas Wayne and socialite Marvel when Bruce was still a child, his parents were shot dead in front of him in an alleyway. And this singular event took his life down the road he never could have anticipated. And after years of training, of studying, of preparation, he became the icon we recognize today. Batman. Now there are entire psychological case studies, college classes, and books written concerning the obvious and numerous psychoses and neuroses that plague the Batman. After all, he's crazy. He has no developed sense of justice. He has a skewed moral compass. He has an obsessive compulsive need to eradicate crime from Gotham City, supported by this inane belief that his solitary actions actually make a difference. He's crazy. After all, it's crazy to identify a problem. It's crazy to make a goal to fix it. It's crazy to make that type of singular effort to stand up for what you believe. It's crazy to be decisive, to have drive, to have vision. Or is it? Think about that, to be decisive, to have drive, to have vision. Is that really so bad? <clears throat> See, there are two problems with our society. You may have experienced them personally. First of all, moving slowly, failing to act decisively with drive, with vision. Instead of pursuing what you want, you twiddle your thumbs to do either have to compromise your beliefs or give up, whether out of, out of fear, the fear of facing adversity, fear of burning bridges. Don't act decisively. And second, this one is almost on a societal scale. Moving without any sort of focus. Or, or conversely, moving with focus too harshly on some sort of immediate gratification. Some sort of immediate want, some immediate need. We focus on immediate gratification. We strive for it. And we forget about the consequences. We pursue options that allow for immediate comfort, not only because we're greedy, but because we are afraid. We are afraid to make choices that, although incredibly beneficial in the future, are inconvenient for us now. We are afraid. And why not? As a society, change on a giant scale is scary because it challenges the status quo, it challenges the institutions, it challenges everything that we may have believed, and that scares us. So we try our hardest to prevent it. However, change is a necessity. See, the reality of our modern world is that it changes, and as such, leadership needs to change with it. It needs to be fluid, because society is fluid. However, institutions are not. And with every new set of leaders, with every new generation, comes new challenges. If those institutions, to meet those challenges, change has to be made. Actual, tangible change. Change in the way we educate, change in the way we govern, change in the way we produce energy and products, change in the way we live. But it's never that easy. See, we all remember the Occupy movement. 
then that 95% famously identified some of the largest problems within our society and famously did absolutely nothing to the screen for change. But for all their willpower, for all their passion, they lack decisiveness, they lack drive, they lack vision. And if anything, they just have become what separates true movement from trending phase. And you are not a trending phase. You cannot put blinders on against social, economic, and political issues. You can't ignore the set of new challenges. You don't have the choice. You have a responsibility. Responsibility to make change. So how do you do that? How do you lead that? What must you become to catalyze that change? That. And that has nothing to do with the Halloween costume gathering dust in your closet. But if that's how you want to swim with it, I applaud your enthusiasm. It means being decisive. <laughs> It means having drive. It means having vision. These are traits that facilitate, if not define, leadership. It's not about charisma. It's not about striking jawlines. It's not even about making the other guy look bad. Leadership is not a tiger bee popularity contest. You're better than that. So prove it to me. Because when you walk out of this room, you're not just you anymore. You're Batman. You have the insight to identify a problem, the willpower to face it, the decisiveness to make the tough choices, and the drive to see them through, and the vision to pull it all together. That's leadership. Is that so bad? Because deep down we get all you said. As an individual, we can all be a little more decisive. As a team, we can all use a little more drive. As a people, we can all use a little more vision. We can all use a little more back. We really appreciate your being here and supporting these young men. So we'll reward you by allowing you to applaud and show that appreciation in a couple of minutes. Judges, thank you for observing our students and scoring them. I know that the rest of us do not envy you for the responsibility of ranking today's contestants. Ladies and gentlemen, before we excuse the judges to complete their evaluations, I would like to introduce them in alphabetical order. Our first judge is Mark Brandeberry. Mark is an account executive with Ivy Tech Corporate College in Lafayette, Indiana. This position allows him to work off this uh, excuse me, this position allows him the opportunity to work with dozens of area manufacturers, retailers, and business in uh, central Indiana. Mark is active in providing educational and entertaining presentations to the community and service groups in Greater Lafayette. He speaks on a range of topics, but, but most deal with marketing through social networking, business development, and higher education. Mark graduated from Purdue University in 1981 and several years ago became a certified manager through the Institute of Certified Professional Managers. Mark, thank you. Our second judge is Walter Gamboa. Walter is a resident of San Antonio but was born in Lima, Peru. He holds a business administration degree from the University of Texas at San Antonio and is an employee of IBC Bank, where he works in customer service. Walter says he got into public speaking while he was in college. He has been a member of Toastmasters International and the local Texas to Te Talkers Toastmasters Club for a little over a year. His family lives here in San Antonio, including his three brothers. In his spare time, Walter enjoys playing the violin, playing soccer, running and breathing. Thank you, Walter. <laughs> Our third judge is Sarita Mayden. Growing up in a military family, Sarita lived in many places, including nine years in Germany. After earning a master's in counseling from the University of Maryland, Sarita pursued a career in university administration. Over 13 years, she held positions at four state universities, including University of Maryland, Old Dominion University, University of California, Davis, and University of California, San Diego. Making a career change in 1993, Sarita became a full-time professional speaker. She started her speaking career as an independent contractor with career track seminars 
and then moved on to her own speaking business. Sarita is on the board of directors for her local YMCA in San Diego and is past chapter president of the National Speakers Association. I should also add that you'll get a chance to judge Sarita yourself this morning as she is our speaker for our first educational session at 1030. I want to thank her for getting up early and helping us out this morning as a speech contest judge. It's very kind of you, Sarita. Our fourth judge is Lynn Powell. Lynn is the executive director for Institute of Certified Professional Managers, ICPM as we all know it, a nonprofit educational institute and business center at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. <clears throat> ICPM is the sponsor of the Certified Manager Certification and internationally recognized professional credential for managers and supervisors, which is recognized in over 60 countries. Prior to joining ICPM, Lynn acquired a diverse set of skills working in banking, healthcare communications, publications, and continuing medical education. She says she has never held a job that she didn't like, and especially enjoys the international aspect of working with customers around the globe. She is an avid tennis player and loves all things canine. Thank you, Lynn. Our fifth judge is Kevin Prescott. Kevin is the principal owner of Sharbeck. Sharbeck is a consulting services firm specializing in providing human resources, leadership, and employee training curriculum, and talent management solutions designed to increase productivity. Mr. Spratt Prescott has a law degree from St. Mary's University and a master's in education with distinction from the University of Incarnate Word. In addition, Mr. Prescott teaches training and development, excuse me, training and developing employees, HR law, and human resources at the University of Texas at San Antonio. His work includes creating strategies to reduce turnover and increase employee engagement, online course development, and employment, as well as leadership development with clients across a variety of industries. Kevin is also a senior professional in human resources and a certified mediator in the state of Texas and has over 20 years of professional experience. Kevin? Our sixth judge is Scott Wood. Scott is the vice president for solutions for IFI training. He has been working in the corporate training area for 25 years. During this time, he has worked with such organizations as Lockheed Martin, U.S. Army, Motorola, CDC, General Electric, Raytheon, Federal Reserve Bank, Siemens, NASA, and Campbell Soup, to name a few. This spring, Scott has also led several workshop, workshops and many of our NMA chapters around the country as well. His specialty is creating cultures that can strategically adapt to our changing times. From 2000 to 2004, he taught business presentation skills as an adjunct professor in the Marriott School of Management at Brigham Young University. Scott has degrees in psychology and communications from Brigham Young University and has helped create 49 professional development training programs. Thank you, Scott. Our seventh judge, judge is Susan Wood. Susan is the co-founder and CEO for IFI Training. And yes, she and Scott are husband and wife. <laughs> she started IFI Training in 1995 with three other partners. These partners had worked for other training companies and weren't satisfied with the attention given to clients or individual participants. Susan believed she could make a difference by giving individuals the skills they need to succeed in life. That became the goal at IFI, to change the world, one individual at a time. Susan has been instrumental in building a curriculum of workshops to transfer skills in the areas of communication, leadership, sales, and professional development. In 1997, the partnership changed, making Susan the primary business owner of IFI training. She has a background in human resources and taught business presentation skills at the Marriott School of Management at Brigham, Brigham University. She has also conducted several 
successful training programs for a number of Fortune 500 companies throughout the U.S. Thank you, Susan, and it's nice to have you and Scott with us today. We look forward to your joint educational session this afternoon. These are our seven judges. I want to thank all of you for taking the time today to help us with the speech contest. Let's give them another round of applause and appreciation. You may now be excused to complete your contest and evaluations. <sighs> At this time, I'd like to ask our marshals and contest volunteer runners to please bring back the contestants so that they may introduce themselves. Everyone who I have known to participate in this has 
enjoyed it for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> and has definitely benefited from it. About me, I hope to go into the medical field where I'm going to college yet, and after that, I have no idea. I'm a junior, I've got time. <laughs> but I hope to go into the medical field. I also enjoy um, competing with piano, classical piano. I do classical voice, and I play basketball competitively. So I will pass the baton to this <laughs> Our gifts. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> 
to tell us a little bit more about Kinetic Kids is one of the founders, Tracy Fontenot, physical therapist. Tracy. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. And on behalf of myself, uh, the other co-founder of Kinetic Kids, Casey Warnley, our board of directors, and all the kids that we serve in our programs, Thank you so much for your generosity for nominating and voting on Kinetic Kids. We're, we're very honored and thankful. Just to tell you a little bit about Kinetic Kids, um, I'm a physical therapist by background, and I worked in a, a children's hospital here in San Antonio with the other co-founder, and we um, saw so many kids coming into physical therapy that had no other options for exercise and socialization with their peers. And we just talked about it, and we were frustrated about it, and. Uh, we felt like all they had for exercise and socialization was physical therapy sessions with us, which isn't that entertaining after a couple of weeks. So we, uh, in 2001, we said, let's just get our kids that we see for therapy and do a baseball team and go out to the fields across the street. So we did that. We got some physical therapy students, um, and we went across the street from the hospital to a baseball field, and Kinetic Kids was born. And that was 2001, and there were about 10 kids. We saw the kids. We were in it for the physical therapy benefits and the exercise. But we saw so much more when they were out there feeling like they were part of the team, not feeling like no one wants me on this team, I'm, I, I shouldn't be here. We saw their parents being able to sit, cheer for their kids, um, form kind of network of friends, and feel like their kids are safe and getting to celebrate them instead of worrying, are they going to be insulted, are they going to fall, are they... So that's what fueled our passion for it. The following year we did another baseball program with 20 kids. In 2003, we served about 60 kids in baseball, gymnastics, art, and music. Um, 2004, about 260 kids, and every year our numbers doubled and tripled. This year, we're on track to serve about 1,500 children in about 90 different programs. <laughs> we offer sports like basketball, baseball, dance, gymnastics, wheelchair sports, swimming, cheerleading, music, musical theater, Flag football, just to name a few. We offer year-round programming, so we have sports every season, and we have, they have different sports to choose from, similar to YMCA, but all for children with special needs. We staff every program with a physical, occupational, recreational therapist, because we believe we can make the children feel safe and successful in having therapists at every program. We serve children 18 months to 18 years. We do not have our own facility, but we use either donated or discounted space around town so that the children can be in the actual setting that the sport takes place. We don't want to put them in a building, isolate them from their peers because that's what happens to them in their daily lives. So we want them in gymnastics facilities, swim facilities, basketball gyms, just like their peers are. Um, that's kind of the crux of what we do, uh, providing our sports and recreational programs for children with special needs. But I want to make sure you understand behind every sport, every program, and every extra effort made by the participants, what we're really doing is not just sports opportunities, but we're transforming their lives. We're giving a place for these children to find and develop self-esteem, which is sometimes very challenging for children with special needs, because where do you find and develop self-esteem when you're not like any of your peers and you feel like you're not excelling at anything? Um, we give families a place to come and celebrate what their children can do. Often they're spent spending a lot of time in doctor's offices, therapy visits, school meetings, being told, child's not going to do this, your child's limited by this, we wish you would do this better, sit up better, walk better, and we feel like at Kinetic Kids they can come and shine and, as they are. So we give families a positive experience to have with their children. Um, and we also give kids a place to belong. Um, we all want to be with people who are similar to us, whether it be, you know, tall, short, interest, and kids with special needs often have a challenging time finding that. So we have found so many friendships develop, so many things that, that are outcomes of providing a sport. They have sleepovers, they form, they go to college together, so we're, we're giving them a place to belong. So in closing, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for doing your part to help us provide opportunities to transform lives. Uh, we're proud to be a presence in this community. Through our programming, and for over 10 years, we've transformed lives by building a strong foundation for children with special needs to build lifelong traits like confidence, self-esteem, dignity, pride, and a place to belong. But none of this would be possible without people like you to make that happen. It's only because of your generous hearts and your open minds that I stand here today, and that obviously all of y'all have a part of that in you, part of, part of that in us as well. 
So thank you for what you've done and know that you represent, that I represent over 1,500 children with special needs who are smiling, laughing, building self-esteem, and feeling a part of the group all because of you. Thank you for your part in transforming lives. Thank you for helping to make the dreams of playing sports a reality for so many kids in San Antonio and the surrounding community. session at 10.30, led by Sarita Maiden, in Salon del Rey South. Sarita's topic is how to stay positive and focused in uncertain times. At 12.30, we'll meet our member of the year at a luncheon in Salon del Rey North. We will announce the winners of the speech contest before lunch is served. Now, let's ask our speech contestants to come up front, please. The audience would like to take pictures and say hello to you. Thank you very much. We are a Since the late 1980s, the speech contest has become a popular activity in most of our chapters. Let me thank you for working so hard on the local level. It takes a lot of time and organization to run the chapter. Today, these young people made it all worthwhile. And to each of them, we say, thank you. The fact that you are here means that you've competed against scores of others along the way. You have been cho chosen as our four best contestants in the nation, and you ought to be very, very proud of that accomplishment. I know we are, for sure. At this time, I'd like to ask Steve Mankey, our animated chairman of the board, to come forward and assist as we introduce our contestants. Steve? Round of applause for Steve. Let me also recognize our National Speech Contest Coordinator and National Director, Mr. John Ponanti from Dayton, Ohio. John, you conducted a very professional contest this morning. Thank you. You made it very, very easy for us. I know for me, for sure. Also want to thank all of the volunteers who helped today. Would everyone who assisted with the contest please stand and be recognized? Please. Don't be shy. Congratulations. <laughs> you folks have been invaluable today. Let's also thank those men and women who gave up their morning to come up and help judge this contest. Would all the judges who stayed for lunch please stand and be recognized once again? Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our four contestants in alphabetical order and have them come forward and spend time right. First, we have Gabriel Colba. Gabriel, Gabriel lives in our northeast area and is from Columbus, Ohio. He is sponsored by the Columbus Public Service Chapter. Secondly, may I introduce Dulcinea Can. She's representing the Pacific North area, she's from Richland, Washington, and is sponsored by the Mid-Columbia Leadership Development Association in Central Washington's Tri-Cities, Richard, Richland, Kennewick, and Pasco. Next, we have Jobert Rosal. Jobert is 
is representing the Pacific South area. He's from San Diego, California. He's sponsored by the San Diego Council. <laughs> and now, Kamaria Washington. Kamaria <laughs> hails from the Northeast area and is from Detroit, Michigan. She's sponsored by the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Leadership Development Association in Detroit, Michigan. Congratulations to all of you. Each of you did an outstanding job this morning. Listening to you was a pleasure. We thank you for making the trip to San Antonio this weekend. I will say that I'm glad I wasn't the judge when I saw you speaking today. You're all winners in my book, and we've enjoyed having you with us. So without further delay, in alphabetical order, I present our two third place winners. The first third place winner and the recipient of a $500 cash prize is from the Pacific South area and sponsored by the San Diego Council of San Diego, California, and Joe Bird Rosal. The second third place winner and the recipient of another $500 cash prize is from the Northeast area and, the, and sponsored by Anime BCBSM, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Leadership Development Association, Detroit, Michigan, Camaria, Washington. <laughs> Second place winner and the recipient of a thousand dollar cash prize. From the Pacific North area and sponsored by the Mid Columbia Leadership Association, Richmond, Washington, Dulcinea Ham. <laughs> Third place winner and the recipient of a $4,000 cash prize is. city of San Antonio and a glorious state of Texas. Let us keep our minds open to learn, grow, and be inspired to renew, strengthen, and add to our business and personal relationships. Let us be thankful for those who protect our freedoms at home and abroad. Protect them and keep them safe. Let us be kind and generous, especially to those with charitable needs. 
Let us pray for all those afflicted or are suffering and accelerate their healing. Let us grow within ourselves to develop our strengths and passions, to have a positive and cheerful presence, live without fear or regret. As leaders, let us recognize to and elevate all, have a pay it forward attitude, and let our actions be our legacy. Enjoy the member of the year lunch celebration. Amen.